Hey folks, uh, remember this channel? Because I did not. I forgot about it. Um, it was a channel just to kind of talk about topics I couldn't get around to on the main channel. Things that you wouldn't see on the main channel. I'm pretty sure I spoke about Spartacus at one point. Uh, I'm trying to revitalize this channel to be a new place for me to talk about movies and shows and just whatever that I, I, I can't get around to on the main channel. It's not to say that there's a degree of like priority. I mean, like, there kind of is. I, I want to make sure the main channel is getting the standards that you have come to know, that I hope you've come to know. But here, uh, the second channel is more of a place for me to talk about stuff where I want to talk about it. I just can't get around to it. It's just not enough time, not enough resources. And th this is going to be, hopefully, making a genuine effort to at least show you all that I watch more than just bad movies on the main channel. So today we're talking about Studio Ghibli's newest film, The Boy in the Heron, which was originally called How Do You Live? So I saw the movie yesterday in theaters and I wanted to see it dubbed. I accidentally saw it subbed instead, which is not like a bad thing. But I avoided the trailers for this film, and the only thing I knew was that apparently Robert Pattinson, who's the voice of the Heron in the English dub, gave like the performance of a lifetime from what I could gather. So I'm going to rewatch the movie and see the English dub when I can, but for the time being, it was the Japanese dub, the sub as it goes, and that was totally fine. It was, there's, there's, there's a certain beauty in watching, you know, the original language from the original country that the movie was made in, where it's like, you know, I'm a fan of sub stuff. I love One Punch Man subbed vastly more than the dub. So this film is about uh, Maito. I'm pretty sure I'm saying his name correctly. A uh, little boy living in Japan uh, during World War II. It's kind of weird because I saw Godzilla Minus One this past week too. I'm like, it's just a Japanese kind of week, I guess, uh, for the theater for me. And uh, I gotta be real, it's been refreshing. It's nice to be like, okay, it's not Marvel films I'm watching. I'm watching something different. I'm watching stuff from Japan that has a lot more, uh, it's a bit more compelling, which is not a dig at Western entertainment necessarily, but I'm like, this is a nice palate cleanser. I'm enjoying this. This is a change of pace I welcome and you don't get too often. But it's about Maito, a little boy living in World War II Japan. I pieced together that his mother at the start, and by the way, spoilers, uh, she dies in what I assume is like an air raid, uh, or there's a fire that killed her at this hospital. And we don't know if the mother was sick. We don't know if she worked at the hospital, but she died in the hospital nonetheless. And Maito was really torn up over it as most young boys who are 11 or 10 would be. Uh, fast forward a few years, the war still going on. Maito and his father move to the countryside. His father runs a factory where they build like the little like glass uh, canopies over the fighter planes for World War II fighters in Japan. Uh, Maito is a, he's very stoic, he's quiet. You can see how he's thinking constantly, but he's not talking as much. Uh, he's, a, he's a polite young boy, uh, bows to his elders, which there are a lot of in this movie. Studio Ghibli loves their old people. Uh, when you look at those films, he's just like all these very uh, wabi-sabi looking older people. I love that. There's a lot of character to them. There's a moment where I'm like, man, that it's like seven or eight old ladies gathered in this house that Maito is moving into. And they all remind me of Yubabwa from Spirited Away. One in particular was she got this wart right there. So Maito is obviously carrying a lot of weight from the loss of his mother, processing it. Uh, makes sense with the original title of the film called How Do You Live? There's this mysterious tower nearby his home. Uh, he has a new mother, by the way. Um, his father remarried quickly and has a baby on the way quite quickly. Seemed very just, you know, very rapid for, for the family to lose a mother and then for another mother uh, to, to, to enter the fray that quickly. But hey, that's life sometimes. And that's interesting. It's like for Maito, makes you wonder how is he going to react to this, to lose his mother, to have a new mother, to have a little sibling on the way, to be in a new home. Uh, and also uh, in typical Ghibli fashion to sprinkle in some magic where it's like not only is this a world that is new and, and scary from a realistic point of view, but also like let's time to get some fantasy in there. There's this heron flying around the premise. 
of the new home in the mountain town. And the heron, like, is eyeing up the boy, uh, kind of messing with him, taunting him, trying to, like, coerce him away from the home. He's being invited to this, this tower, this home that's on the property. It's been abandoned. Apparently, it's cursed. People who live on the property are like, yeah, don't, don't uh, go there. There was once this, like, grand uncle of the family who was, like, really smart and, and I guess, successful, who we built this tower around a meteor that landed on the planet like 60 years ago and there's like just questionable things that happen there it's kind of confusing uh, this this film's confusing that's one of the the main critiques about this film i've seen online is how there's moments where it feels like there's everything and nothing happening at the same time uh and, and it's not as linear as you would expect there's there's moments where it makes you go what's happening who's this what's the significance of this scene what does it represent it's a very abstract film and that's not a bad thing uh it, it's it's ethereal it's dreamlike uh because maito who <laughs> builds his own bow and arrow out of bamboo and a nail and like using a feather of the heron goes to confront the heron. he wants to kill that that motherfucker and in the process, he and an old lady, while searching for his mother, who went, his new stepmother, who's missing, um, they all go to the tower and get transported to like a different realm of existence. Um, it was confusing. Uh, I, I still was wondering, like, are these events actually happening? Is is this uh, in the the head of the kid or what? Um, Oh, by the way, the kid, to kind of paint up the kind of person that he is, uh, before these events transpired, he went to school, got into a fight with another kid, got all bruised and bashed, and in order to save face, to, de de to deny they got into a fight, to go rock, and he smacked his head and created this massive cut. And I feel like, like these films, you have to be asking yourself questions actively, like, what was the point of that? Why would he do that? Is it his honor? Is he in denial? Is he trying to hide something? Does he want to keep a low profile? Is it all of that combined? Good, I don't know. Uh, the kids, stoic is the word I would use. He's a very stoic little guy. So, go to the dream world, and there's like ocean everywhere. Uh, that's a cool part. Maybe think about Spirited Away, where you've got like the islands, and it feels kind of isolated. And I say island for Spirited Away, I don't even know technically. The geographical like like design or, or <laughs> a manifestation uh, of the home the little bathhouse and and spirit away it's it, again it, it too is very ethereal and sometimes you don't have to answer all these questions the the, the question just asking questions is an important part of the experience because it makes you feel lost and there's a, a beauty in feeling lost and and, and wonder um Though there was question after question after question I was asking while watching The Boy and the Heron, where I'm like, where are we exactly as far as, like, the significance of being here? What are the ways of life here? They seem not just mysterious, but a little confusing. Uh, there's something called, like, the Wada Wada, I believe? These little floating marshmallow people who are, like, being fed fish by uh, Maito and... Um, Oh, there's a, I did catch this. There was, um, again, spoilers. There was the old lady who went with Mike though. And then a, a younger lady showed up and I'm like, oh, she's wearing the same shirt as that old lady. It's her, but young now. And there's this mystery before they even went to the tower where they're like, the folks in the premise are like, oh, it's, um, people go missing. Uh, the stepmother's sister went missing here. And then she came back. And a year later, and she was totally fine. It's just, you know, a dangerous and mysterious place. Don't don't mess with that. You can definitely feel those spiritualistic undertones, which I'm always a big fan of when it comes to Ghibli films and their folklore that they, they dip from as far as those wells of, of information, of story, of adventure. And I'm always, again, Japanese folklore is a lot more just, I don't know, it just feels beautiful and romantic get dangerous and and like oh I'm, I'm i'm excited but there's danger and that makes things more exciting maito is in the second act just kind of getting his bearings uh, the, the one the one line you know because people say it's not linear 
Fortunately, it, it is enough because, you know, he's looking for his stepmom. He wants to get her home. Uh, he believes she's, that she's in this realm that he's in. And that's the, 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 you know, the driving point of the film. Where is the mother? Can we get her back? And as far as asking, like, what's what's like the moral of this film? Because at the very end, uh, throughout the film, he meets this little girl who is like a I think her name is like Kimmy or something like that. She has fire powers in this ethereal world. And she, as soon as I saw the fire of her, I'm like, oh, is that the mom? Is it the mom? You know, this is the parallel of the mom dying in the fire. And this new character is apparently the sister of his stepmother. She's also in the fire, um, has fire powers. What does this all mean? And it means that it's like there's different realities existing at the same time is what it reveals. Because ultimately, um, this feels like a giant like crossroads for multiverses and timelines, where that fire girl, who might though becomes friends with, that's his mom. You know, spoiler alert! I did say spoilers at the start of this video, so don't hate me for that. And also, okay, from my understanding, that means his father married his mother and then married his aunt, which I'm like, that's a bit unorthodox, but technically i guess fine it's a bit taboo but it's fine and then as far as his grand uncle goes he's in the you know the mysterious figure in this building and kind of like the the puppet master not in like a nefarious way but there's you know, something about him controlling the world trying to keep it in order trying to keep things you know he'll introduce things to this this fictional world of magic and there's like this tower of like stones of marble he's cut out pieces and he has to every day keep it from falling over so I'm like, okay, the uncle must have been given some mantle of power by this meteor that landed there years ago and it has imbued its magic upon him and these different like timelines and doors to different universes. It's, it's confusing. Um, and not confusing the point of bad because not understanding something doesn't mean it's, it's that you're stupid uh, or that there needs to be something to be understood, to be honest, sometimes it's just like, there's no point. Um, I, I guess I, the beholder, as far as how you want to make that out, because I've seen this conversation where folks are talking about media literacy, being like, you, you don't understand the boy and the heron. Well, sounds like you're stupid. And it's like, no, I, this, this, come now. Um, I, I, I would say this is a film that is abstract enough that multiple viewings are, I wouldn't I wouldn't oppose it. I, mean, I want to see it again. I want to have a different lens of watching the film. I, I feel that there's multiple movies and experiences where a piece of media, it would benefit from you, know, you taking the time to sift through it and you can gain things from said experiences in different ways. I've watched, oh God, I'm going to get laughed at for bringing this up as an example. I've watched Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul multiple times, which is a far more linear story compared to The Boy and the Heron. But there's so much I can pick up every single time where I'm like, oh, I didn't catch that. Oh, that's pretty nuanced. Oh, that's a pretty cool Easter egg. Or I didn't catch that that moment. Um, same thing with when I watched Dune. When I first watched the first Dune part one, I did not like it. I'm like, oh, I don't care for this film. It just seems so pretentious and the music's too much. And I just don't understand this weird universe. It seems kind of full of itself. I love Dune now. I can't wait for Dune Part 2. And that's because I watched the movie, and then I watched it again for the hell of it. And then I watched it over, and I've watched it like 10 times since then at least. And uh, I can't wait for Part 2. I'm, I read the book. Uh, I even got into Dune Messiah. This isn't about Dune. What I'm trying to say is, I feel like for a film like The Boy and the Heron, I can't judge it too hard initially, because I do think it's a film that does require another viewing to really get the full picture. However, for folks who do watch it only once, they're fully entitled to just have their one critique based on that one viewing because that's their prerogative. And for a lot of folks, they're like, it's confusing. What's the point? What exactly is the story here? It feels very cryptic. And I think that's, that is the point. It's supposed to be cryptic. It's supposed to be dreamlike. And that's not necessarily an automatic defense of quality. Uh, cause I mean, I wouldn't blame the person who is like, no, I understand the deeper meanings. 
And I wouldn't blame a person who's like, nope, this isn't my speed. It's a little bit confusing. Because there's a part in like the second act where I'm like, I can't really follow what's happening here. Or even the significance of certain things. But at the end, to bring it full circle, I was finally able to piece together the pieces. The third act picks up and it gets exciting. I love the parakeets, by the way, they're so goofy. Um, I still don't understand the significance of birds in this film. And I say that knowing that the heron is in the title. And even then I'm like, you know, it's a character. I wasn't crazy about him. I, I didn't understand why he was like a little man inside the heron's body. If that's supposed to represent his soul, if there's some duality to it. Uh, I, I don't, I, I, at this moment, don't know why the Heron was the way it was beside his personality being a bit more of like a, just kind of a jester, not jester, but a menace in some ways, but also a kind of a guide. Cause I know that a Heron as an actual bird is a very like dinosaur like bird. It will destroy any little animal in its eco ecosystem, predatory, graceful. Um, but I don't know, maybe in, J in Japan, there's this, this other, you know, cultural, um, lore behind the bird but for me for me at the moment the bird itself the heron i'm just kind of like yeah you know he was, he was fine he was a cool character i think i've seen ghibli films with far cooler you know mystical characters that were of interest to me like no face but for this movie i'm like it suffices and again i'm gonna give myself the benefit of watching it once more to see how i feel a second time a third time and maybe it'll grow on me um the message of the film, I heard folks saying it's about nihilism. I disagree. I, I don't see nihilism. I believe in nihilism. I, I, I think nihilism is a good thing um, in my own personal belief, and I respect that of others, but more of a the temporary moment of life, how we're only here for, you know, make the most of it. Um, and, and there's no shame in thinking there's nothing afterwards or that in the grand scheme of the universe, we don't matter. Uh, teach their own. I'm also a big believer in stoicism and in the human spirit, but as far as the ego death that comes from knowing that we aren't the eye of the universe, I think it's important. And uh, But I don't see that in this film. This film to me seems more about grief, more about acceptance. And because Maito lost his mother and this is a story about him accepting that she's gone and moving on. Or so I, to my understanding, he meets his mother when she's a kid and she's like, I know I die in a fire, but I can't wait to live my life. And I'm like, that's the spirit. Maybe that's the nihilism to it, which even then I wouldn't say is necessarily like existential levels of nihilism, just more of a, I can't wait to live my life. Even if it ends in tragedy, I can't wait to live it. And that's beautiful. You know, how do you live? I think that's, that's a good title to apply to Maito to accept that his mother's gone, but now how do you live with having that knowledge and having that burden and having that grief? Well, and that's a call back to Better Call Saul again, but uh, that's a big point in that movie, in that show. It's a show, not a movie, unless it's El Camino. No, but uh, how there's grief and acceptance is another theme in that show. And for one of the characters, he talks about how there's a day you wake up uh, and you won't think about that tragedy that you feel like defined you before and that you'll go about your morning and you won't think of it. And then when you do realize you haven't thought of it, that's when you realize that you can learn how to forget. And I'm not saying that's necessarily an exact parallel. I'm drawing to the boy and the heron, but I can see similarities in my opinion where it's like Maito was able to accept his mother's gone to let go of that that burden of of guilt or or of of just feeling grief and know that it's okay and that you can move on with your life now the grand uncle in his design of the world i don't know if that's him trying to persist in his creation thinking that you need to be supplanted by a successor or what's the point of having it? Maybe I can see a bit of that theming, of that symbolism, uh, to also accept that sometimes you won't be supplanted. It's just goodbye, moving on. Um, I can see that. But as far as the visuals go, this movie, fantastic, beautiful. Uh, this is Studio Ghibli. It's what they do best. Uh, they never phone it in with their visuals. They always go all out, especially at the beginning with the fire scenes. Love the character designs. The Heron's such a weird character. 
uh, as far as how they, they he's written but visually you know i just uh it's all so weird, but I enjoy it. I, I like the creepiness, the weirdness. There's a, again, with Ghibli, you always feel like you're in a world of mystery that's not inherently good or inherently evil. Uh, it's There's this ambiguity to... There's this ambiguity to uh, the creatures and people and, and, and just characters of these worlds. Um, I, I think it's cool. It makes me feel like there's they're not as simple as you think and that there's a lot of variety and and possibilities with where these characters can take you. So those are just my uh, general impressions of The Boy and the Heron. It's a great film. Uh, I would highly recommend checking it out. Um, in a day and age where a lot of movies feel like products, to know that Ghib Ghibli still understands how important it is to create art, which this is absolutely art, I think that's worth supporting on its own merit. So, hey, for those who saw The Boy and the Heron, let me know what you'll think down in the comments and I will see you all next time. And I'll keep making videos here on the channel that are again, a bit more just me and the camera talking, but I'll be back here at scavengers range or scavengers reign. I can see the title, right? Uh, the blue white samurai, uh, Carol and the end of the world. I think that's the name of the title of the show. There's more I want to talk about. So I'll see y'all real soon. Bye.